Let's talk about war in the Middle Ages. Now, first off, the time period is about 1000 to 1300, so the High Middle Ages, if you want to call it that. And let's begin with battles. Now, battles were rather limited. So there was a certain version of battles. And the reason for this was that they were high cost and high risk. So even if you had a large army, you tried to avoid a battle. There were several reasons for this. First off, many battles were actually not that decisive. And even if they were decisive, sometimes the outcome wasn't what one wanted. And this was for the reason that usually the ruler itself was also present on the battlefield. And quite on a few occasions he, he died or was captured. And so this could actually mean that he probably would have won the battle or won the battle, but he died or was mortally wounded. So this was one thing. The other was when he received high losses or if the victory was there, but the enemy retreated to all the, the castles and fortifications and could still, he would still have to fight all the sieges, which were also a major problem, which we get later to. Now there was a certain exception when battles were actually pursued and this was usually during conquest, like the Battle of Hastings, con uh, conquest of England, or in a civil war. These were the two main differences when actually battles were really pursued. Else they usually tried to avoid major battles. Now major battles were not common, but nor were they rare. And at the same time, the thing is usually we get reported the battles, the great events, the big ones. Because these are what are usually in, in the chronicles and which make up better documentaries and everything else. So, yet at the same time, there was basically constant warfare. If we take Richard Lionheart, for instance, in the last 26 years of his life, 25 years he spent on campaign. And Actually, we are not sure because there's one year we don't know what he did. So he probably was also on campaign there. And the issue for this constant warfare was it was sometimes used to settle disputes with petty war, basically. So the nobles had something, a problem with each other, and then sometimes they referred to war. And this was usually and often done with raids. So raids were the common thing and because they were rather cheap and you could inflict damage on the enemy economy and also inflict damage on its willpower. So this was the preferred means or they raided each other. And this was also an important part in general. There was a war of attrition. So ravaging was usually quite common. Cutting enemy supply lines, crop destruction, poisoning water sources and all this around. And and there were several reasons for this. Plunder, for instance, was a part of pay, so it was quite common. Then also attack the enemy economic base. And one problem, although, was with ravaging, that for that usually you have to disperse your army, which made it rather uh, vulnerable to attack. If an enemy concentrated and he attacked, he could overcome a part of your army. The other thing was if they stayed together, since sometimes the supplies were, were too low, they could starve. So there was this risk, stay together and starve or disperse, but get, get maybe overwhelmed. So this was always, this had to take into account. And this is also a problem, it was really expensive with supply lines and everything. And Vegetius, a, a Roman writer, and but he was the most read in medieval times in terms of war, he basically said, if you can press the enemy with famine, it's better than to press him with the sword. And this was strictly, or this was rather well followed. Now let's look at sieges. Now sieges are basically a special form of battle and they were also quite risky. Because if you took your army out and attacked an enemy and belay siege to his castle, you exposed your homeland and also your besieging army because you set up a camp and everything. So this was also, you were basically in the open around the besieged castle or fortification or city. And basically the siege is about isolation in terms of politics, armies and other fortifications. 
So you, you had to cut him off from the network of the other fortifications, but also sometimes from political allies. This was especially the case with larger cities. And this is also the thing, besieging a large city was an enormous effort. You needed a large army, you needed special equipment, special personnel, a lot of organization and also a, a rather large control above your forces. Because you need, you need to remember those forces were usually from different lords and everything. This was a, a patchwork. So, and desertion was extremely high and also you had to supply this large army laying the seed, be, uh, doing the siege. And so in a way, the besieged and the besieger have had the same challenges. Both had to keep the food and both had to keep the morale up. Because if, if one of the two broke, or basically both then, then, well, it was a major problem. But this was inside the, the siege and, and from the besieger itself. This is quite interesting. Now, the next thing is about fortifications and castles. Although nowadays, when we think of a castle or a fortification, we usually think about stone. But especially in the early Middle Ages, most fortifications were timber and earth. And they already provided quite an obstacle. Any fortification was a major problem for an army because you, you need to starve it out or you need special equipment or even if you can dig around it, it, it takes a certain amount of time, specialized personnel and everything. You, you come to a halt, your maneuvering goes down, everything. And the other thing is if you see a castle today, those are very often not so representative because these are basically those that survived. These are the huge stone castles that were of major importance. But the, there were way more castles and fortifications, but these usually rotted away or were destroyed or used for something else. So if you usually see a castle nowadays, it's most likely not really an average castle in any stretch of the imagination. Another issue about a castle was not simple a military institution. It provided in general stability for the region, to control the region, to control the influence and everything. And, and this is also important, although it was mainly a defensive structure, it could also be used offensively. For instance, as a base for attack. You had a garrison there and this garrison could also be mounted, for instance, so you could easily launch a raid. And in combination with other castles, you could always try, and if an enemy entered your country, to cut off its supply lines with the garrison or something. So a castle is not just the static construction, you could say. It had quite an, an, a reach in, in the political and in the military sense. Now the next thing are armies. Now armies were were expensive to raise and to maintain. And there was always a, a problem with supply, desertion and also disease. Something we don't face this nowadays, but back then it could happen that a few thousand died from disease. And there's one major difference to the previous time, to the, to the Roman times. There, were, there was no infrastructure there. Rome had its barracks and everything. There was a whole infrastructure set up for the army. In this case, in the medieval, medieval times, for, for this period, there wasn't. So basically, those armies were all ad hoc units. They were raised and then afterwards they were disbanded. And usually the army had rarely more than a few thousand men. And, and even that was already a, a major army. And one reason for the, for, the, for the rather small size of this army was because the major the major element of wealth in the Middle Ages was land ownership. But one problem with land ownership is you can't liquefy it rather fast, so you don't, you don't have much cash from it. So, and, and this, when, when the economy got better later on, the armies grew in size. And this is very important, no standing armies at this point, so only at hard formations. Now, final point is the limits of the cavalry. Quite often the cavalry is displayed as this complete supremacy unit that just rolls over the infantry and everything. But this is not quite true. 
Although cavalry has a very high mobility and weight and also more reach than a regular infantry, it was also extremely expensive. And both in raising and also in maintaining. So for, for instance, if you have a large cavalry force, you actually need to disperse it to have enough grassing area and everything. So it gets quite complicated. And you can also see that cavalry was not that ultra important because many commanders spent quite a lot of trouble or went into a lot of trouble to, to raise large infantry formations. And why would they do this if cavalry was so much better? And this is the point, they tried to have mostly um, a good combination of infantry, archers and, and cavalry. So combined arms warfare to a certain degree was already central. So although cavalry had a major influence on the battlefield, it often had the deciding factor. And the famous cavalry charge is especially in medieval times quite problematic. Because those were all knights, those were basically individual fighters. They were not usually trained to fight in a close order right charge, which is already complicated. And even to Napoleonic times, and here you have now all these, these knights that know each other probably from tournaments and from politics, but then they should charge together in closed order formation. This is a real command and control and also organization issue to perform this. So this is sometimes not quite well presented in movies, I think. And if such a charge went wrong, then this could have dire consequences. So as always, sources are in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.